human-centered uh, would change from teaching the love of things and using people to loving people and using things. And one of the things that we have to realize, a thing, an idea is a thing, an ideology is a thing. These are human creations. Whereas humans are an end in themselves and sacred. And thus, if the principle of loving people and using things would change the whole paradigm. And the other is, uh, if we have a human-centered, then we can come back to recognizing the importance of the very core word of education. Educare means to draw out. And to draw out the human, what makes us human is, a, is, a very, is the first most important question that every one of our educational institutions has to contend with. Because if they remain mainly focused as training institutions, um, we will not be able to keep up with, uh, with, with a balance uh, between human, meeting human needs and the needs of institutions that exploit people with robotics, quantum computing, uh, and the advances in nanotechnology are largely going to change the relationship between labor and people. And if we don't organize our educational institutions to focus on meeting human needs uh, rather than meeting marketplace needs uh, will have enormous disruptions that, that, that will cause greater in, inequities. So I just boiled down your whole talk to a, a, a motto that I keep in front of myself, love people, use things, never love things and use people. There was a book written in the 1960s by Philip Slater, a psychologist at Yale University called The Pursuit of Loneliness, in which he characterized the qualities that are necessary to, to become the head of an American multinational corporation. And then he analyzed what are the qualities that are needed for someone to grow old and be lonely, to live a life of loneliness and disconnect. And he lined up the qualities to rise in the corporate ladder as the same as the qualities to become lonely. So he posed a complete disconnect between the pursuit of leadership and the pursuit of happiness. And I thought that was really implicit in much of what we were saying today, that leaders have to be integrated people and that leadership has to be grounded in human qualities that bring security and happiness. The most dysfunctional institutions we have today, I believe, are exemplified by the $1.9 trillion spent in the pursuit of security through the threat of annihilation. And I look carefully at the educational backgrounds and the methodologies of the people leading those institutions who do it in stealth without public discourse of the power they have. So if you look at this at STRATCOM, the strategic command, which does the strategic planning for the US military, the, the predominant military power on the planet that came up with the shock and awe uh, catastrophe of Iraq. They all have backgrounds in, from state universities in hard sciences. They all are expert in operational thinking, in thinking that is totally devoted to the measurement of things. So they could tell President Bush, yes, we can win the war in Iraq very easily because we can control transportation, we can control food, we can control communications, but they didn't have any understanding of human beings. That if you invade a country and you bomb them, they're not going to be happy with you. How basic is that? And how basic is it when they still remain the predominant institution that governs our state? So the current budget of the United States, Biden's military budget was just increased by $26 billion with no debate. And that kind of leadership that can be silent and govern and get that kind of money is something we have as as it leading intellectuals, we have to uncover that 
we have to pull away the cover on how decisions are really being made. What are the metrics that are being used? What is the definition of success? And that to me goes to the teleology of, the, of, of education. Is it job training or is it developing human beings? And how do you, and, and, and of course you can't separate productive economics from human beings, but it's not, but productive economics are not the end in themselves. It's the human beings are the end in themselves. When you forget that you end up with technique, the technique of education rather than the purpose. And everybody spoke about purpose. And I thought that was really important, but this is a larger, this is a larger problem of modernity being so fascinated with our human creativity, which has just exploded since the scientific revolution. So we end up with art without beauty, philosophy, art that's about the technique of art, philosophy that's about the technique of philosophy, not the pursuit of truth and beauty, um, religion based on uh, dogma, uh, rights, rituals, and dogma rather than love and transcendence, a financial system not grounded in the production of goods and services, but is creates wealth in the financial system. Uh, uh, medicine without healing, without, without the fullness of healing, just technique. Education without character and the production of weaponry without security because we don't have people thinking about the why. And that of course, I think is part of the value of the World Academy of Arts and Science, that we are a forum in which the discussion of the why is appropriate. And, and so we're not, leaders in, we're not leaders in business. We're not leaders in art per se. We're leaders, we should be leaders in the belief that ideas matter, thought matters, the meaning of things matter. And that's what, and, and so the, the WASP was created by some people who are brilliant at both operations, and thinking, who have ab absolutely changed society. I mean, Albert Einstein certainly changed society and had a lot to say about the organization of society and values, as did Bertrand Russell, actually. So it's our mandate at WAS to bring about catalytic ideas that can change the direction of these major institutions. And last but not least, I thought one of the things that should not go by us is that so much of the thinking of the leaders of our political institutions is governed by fear. And actually, because of the 10K, the quarterly reporting requirements of corporations, um, the fear of market fluctuations governs a great deal of business planning. I've, in, my, in my life, I've been in-house counsel at a public company. So I saw up close how quarterly reporting, which is really fear-based, governs thinking. We're now learning from neuroscience that when we were in a panic mode, we actually think in a different part of our brain than we do when we are in a more reflective mode. It's totally astonishing that what, we, what we're learning recently in neuroscience. And aggressive operational thinking is privileging people in too many of our institutions, whereas reflective, patient, humble, caring, insightful thinking is burdened. And I think it's because it's because we have forgotten the why. So I'm for, I, I'm, I'm 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 giving I'll give you an example. I'm uh, putting together a conference on rethinking security at Stanford, and I'm working with with some of the most prestigious professors there. And I said, we need to have some neuroscientists in, in this discussion. And everybody said, why? <laughs> and I said, because people think differently in crises and how many people on the National Security Council today have the capacity for reflective thinking? And then, and then I said, let's look at the Cuban Missile Crisis. If you didn't have Ted Sorensen there, we likely would have ended the world because almost everybody else on, was an operational thinker. What do we do? And he stepped back and said, 
Let's look at the whole thing. Let's slow it down. Let's get some time. So um, I think that what came out of this is a mandate for us uh, to, to encourage WAS uh, to address leadership in education because uh, there were so many rich ideas that are worth further uh, exploration and elucidation.